Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you again for taking the time to join us. My name is Heidi Hernandez-Gaddy. I'm the Director of Partnerships and Engagement here at TIES. Um, TIES, as I think all of you know, is a values-based social change platform. We leverage individual and institutional leadership and investment to positively impact our local and global communities. Um, and today, we are absolutely delighted to be sharing this conversation as a part of a series called Connecting the Dots. Uh, as we all know, the recent federal budget deal and resulting fallout in the financial markets have serious implications on our economic landscape, and, and those implications um, are, are really compounded very much in the nonprofit sector. As nonprofit and philanthropic institutions, we are uniquely affected and need to go beyond just thinking about how do we continue to do more with less and think about how we can help present solutions and work with our communities and constituencies um, to advocate in the best possible way for, for good outcomes. Um, uh, we are today a group of leaders from across the country. Um, folks on the call represent both philanthropic leaders and nonprofit leaders, board members, um, so we are in very good company. Um, this series, Connecting the Dots, is presented in partnership with the Greenlining Institute, the Mitchell K. Poor Foundation, Northern California Grant Makers, and the National Center for Responsive Philanthropy. With that, I won't take too much more of your time um, as we have some really fabulous experts to lead this conversation. Um, I ask people to keep their lines muted so that we can have the best possible quality of phone call. And then um, if you have questions, I'm going to ask you to email them to me at h-g-a-t-t-y at tides.org. That's h-g-a-t-t-y at tides.org. With that, I will introduce the moderator of this conversation, uh, Samuel S. Kang, who is Greenlining Institute's general counsel. Uh, at Greenlining, Sam is responsible for crafting the strategies that maximize the organization's cooperative opportunities. He's led several successful campaigns impacting state and national policy. He works with the heads of federal and state regulatory agencies, corporate executives, and community leaders, as well as providing strategic guidance to members of the California Legislature and U.S. Congress. I am delighted to introduce Sam and Greenlining um, and know that we are in very capable hands with this conversation. With that, I will turn it over to you, Sam. Well, thank you very much for that generous introduction, Heidi. Um, and uh, I won't take much time either because the true expert uh, that we have on the line today is uh, the person that, uh, whose brains we'll be picking uh, throughout this conversation. Uh, briefly about Greenlining and why we're interested in this. The Greenlining uh, Institute was uh, formed almost 20 years ago by a group of ragtag civil rights leaders who marched with Dr. King and Cesar Chavez back in the 1960s and up until the 70s. And uh, after Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law, uh, these ragtag group of leaders got into a room, uh, got together in a room, and asked themselves, "What now? We got our civil rights. Um, uh, what do we do with that?" And they quickly figured out, in order to implement those civil rights, in order to enjoy those civil rights, they had to get access to their capital rights. And from that, the Green Line Institute was formed. Uh, the redlining was the actual practice of financial institutions in the 1960s and 70s um, to draw red lines around neighbors, neighborhoods they wouldn't lend capital to. The Green Line uh, Institute was formed as an antidote to red line activities to fight predatory lending to make sure our communities get access to capital in order to enjoy the civil rights that they are deserved uh, from the Constitution. So why we care about this issue specifically is because uh, we started looking at this issue in terms of who's paying taxes, taxes and who's making up um, the largest percentage of, uh, of, of the federal government's revenue. And we got some information from the federal government in terms of uh, who's actually paying taxes and who's not. And as a result, we published a report this summer called Corporate America on Tax, Tax Avoidance on the Rise, which found some startling results in terms of who's actually paying taxes. And I can tell you, it's not the Fortune 100 companies. And we published this report in great detail. And if you'd like to see the report, and you can download for free at www.greenlining.org, that's G-R-E-E-N-L-I-N-I-N-G.org, you can see for yourself why we're so vested in this issue. Uh, because it's an issue of not just fairness, 
in terms of who is actually paying taxes to solve this problem, to solve the crisis of the federal deficit, but also it's an issue of access, uh, basic access to capital and basic uh, uh, access to services that we all enjoy um, as a nation, as a society, but uh, figuring out who should be paying what in terms of how to enjoy those civil rights and those rights that are afforded to us living in the United States. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to moderate the discussion today. Um, and one of the things that we'll be talking about over this course of this conversation is what exactly is going on? Um, because as many of you on the call know, and um, in the mainstream society know, there was a big fight over the summer in terms of uh, the Republican-led Congress and the Obama administration uh, getting into a squabble over the issue of raising the debt ceiling and how that uh, had the residual consequence of talking about what kind of uh, deficit we have and what we need to do to fix it, to, to, to fix it I'm sorry. However, um, what most people don't realize is the problem was not actually fixed. Uh, two sides had punted on the issue, and as a result of that, um, a joint committee of Congress was formed, uh, composed of six senators and six members of the House of Representatives, um, to uh, look at this issue and try to plug uh, a, tr uh, a trillion dollar uh, gap in terms of the deficit and they have to come up with a plan that must be voted in and signed into law by President Obama by the end of this year. Uh, and this is uh, the central issue that we'll be discussing, and we'll be discussing what the consequences are, are of this. So joining me on the call, without further ado, is the true expert. Uh, if you want to talk about who's really in the loop on this and who really is some of the uh, key pitchers playing inside baseball, it's our expert, uh, Ellen Niesenbaum. Ellen Niesenbaum is the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, she works directly with federal policymakers and with other national, state, and local organizations on a broad range of policy issues. These include uh, federal budget and tax issues, Social Security, federal policies concerning Medicaid and health care, and so forth. Um, she's regarded as one of the leading legislative directors among uh, 501c nonprofit organizations in Washington and is frequently used as a resource to support a number of organizations. Uh, coalitions by providing technical assistance, strategic guidance, and communications and messaging planning for their legislative activities. So I'd like to first introduce uh, Ms. Ellen Niesenbaum. Welcome, Ms. Niesenbaum. Thank you very much. And Glad like, to be here. Uh, just like to dive into the conversation by asking you, uh, could you please uh, set us up with uh, the big picture of what is going on here? Uh, what are the main issues that this Joint Committee of Congress is tackling, otherwise referred to as the Gang of Twelve, and what's left to be decided? Okay. Um, so let me just also thank you all so much for having me. We're really thrilled to be able to do this and very much appreciate all the incredible work that I know you guys do at the local level and elsewhere on all these issues. Um, let me just um, say a couple words about um, the, the back you up a little bit to remind you of how we got here, and that was that in the summer, um, I think as Sam may have noted, we had obviously this crisis over the debt ceiling and the risk of default, and what was passed on a bipartisan basis this summer was a two-part process designed to, re to reduce the federal budget deficit by upwards of two, $2.1 trillion over the next 10 years. The summer agreement, which avoided a default and extended the debt ceiling for about a year, included a significant down payment on deficit reduction this summer with the adoption of about $900 billion of cuts, um, uh, including, by the way, if you throw in interest, it's closer to a trillion, that will be implemented over the next 10 years through the annual appropriations process in Congress. That was the first part of the process, and that is already playing out in the battles that you're beginning to see uh, in Congress in beginning to move the appropriations bills for the next fiscal year with the cuts starting to show up in bills like the Labor, Health, and Human Services Bill and other areas. Now, the second part of the process was, as Sam indicated, was the creation of a temporary committee. It's called the Joint Select Committee. Sometimes people refer to it as the Super Committee. Um, I don't even like to give it that name. I just call it the Joint Committee. Um, and that Joint Committee is tasked with coming up by late November 
a second package of deficit reduction. The goal for the committee is $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years, but that's really not the number to focus on. The committee is essentially set up with um, a requirement that they produce a bill that reduces the deficit by $1.2 trillion over the next decade, and if they fail to do that, then in the beginning of 2013, not 2012, in the beginning of 2013, um, there would be automatic across-the-board cuts. This is often referred to in Washington as a, sequ as a sequester, like a cut of, you know, sequestering part of a program um, that would affect a wide range of programs. It would, um, however, there are some exemptions. Social Security could not be cut. Low-income entitlement programs like Medicaid and SNAP or food stamps could not be cut. There are limits on what you could cut in Medicare. The brunt of the across-the-board cut would fall on federal funding for domestic appropriations, um, which, of course, as I said, has just um, been cut by $900 billion last year. So the committee has um, actually very few weeks left to try to see if they could reach an agreement. In theory, everything is on the table. Um, and the notion here is, since you've done the discretionary cuts, that the real focus of this commission is really on revenues and entitlements. Um, it's not um, out of the realm of possibility that they could go back and get more cuts on appropriations, but the real focus here is on revenues and entitlements. Now, it's also not all or nothing. The Joint Committee could fall short of $1.2 trillion. Let's say they came up with a package of $600 billion. You could, under the law, pass that deficit reduction package, and then your across-the-board cuts, would be, um, which would be implemented in 2013, um, would make up the difference. So it, it, is, it is not all or nothing, although politically, I actually think that's more how it, it plays out. We can come back to that. Um, if, the, uh, if the agreement uh, reaches $1.2 trillion, then obviously the sequester is at stake. I think it is just worth noting here that when we think about focusing on entitlements and revenues, we ought to really um, remind ourselves and remind policymakers of what the real drivers are of the long-term deficit. Uh, we often hear that, quote, entitlements are out of control or, quote, spending is out of control. Well, when you look at the increase in the deficit um, and what are the factors that are driving the big deficits, and we look, for example, in 2019, it's virtually uh, half of the increase in the big deficit and debt, public debt, comes just from the Bush tax cuts as well as the cost of the wars in Iraq and Iran. Almost 40 percent of the increase in the long-term debt really comes just from the Bush tax cuts. Um, the wars are about another 10 or 12 percent. They're obviously, um, part of the increase in the deficit is obviously the recession. Um, part of it, although it's not a significant part by any stretch of the imagination, comes from the measures that the Congress has adopted since 2008 to deal with the uh, to the economic recovery. But in no way, shape, or form, for example, is funding for domestic appropriations any significant factor in the increase in the long-term deficit. And yet, as I said, we've already put into place very deep uh, discretionary cuts over the next 10 years. So I think that is the answer to the first question. So, Ellen, thank you so much for that overview. Uh, I want to remind listeners on this call that if you have any questions that you'd like to direct uh, to Ellen, please email Heidi at hgatty, H-G-A-T-T-Y, at tides, T-I-D-E-S, dot O-R-G. Ellen, uh, let me just continue the conversation uh, by asking you, um, we start off with the big picture. I want to get further on the ground now. Uh, to the extent uh, that you can comment on this issue, how do you think that this, you said the brunt of the cuts uh, that this joint committee is looking at um, is uh, the amount of uh, federal appropriations. Do you see what consequences this may have for uh, nonprofit, nonprofit, and philanthropic institutions trying to provide uh, services to underserved communities, specifically as a result of the brunt of these cuts being focused in that area. 
Yeah, excellent question. And, and let me just, um, you know, I think part of the answer to that, and, and here too we ought to step back and remind ourselves, we've just seen the census data come out in September. We obviously have significant increases in poverty, and I think what really struck us here at the center more than um, any of the very range of disturbing uh, figures that came out is that we have an enormous increase in the number of Americans that are living below half the federal poverty line. This has really reached historic and unprecedented levels. Bob and I were briefing a senator this morning um, and, and said to them, do you realize that there are now 20 million Americans who are living below half the poverty line? We think the the uh, growth in poverty, the tremendous continued growth in income inequality, the number of Americans that lack health and insurance, all of those in our view have a direct correlation to what's at stake in the joint committee and what the policymakers should consider as viable options and frankly what they should rule out as options for deficit reduction. Um, I mean, this is now a, uh, an issue where I think the goal here of what one would want to see is a balanced deficit reduction package, and if there could be a big balanced package, we think that's probably a good thing. By balance, I mean balance in terms of cuts in revenues, and we really think it's critical for the committee to do virtually um, for every dollar of cuts, there should be a dollar of revenues. It's also essential, and this has a lot to do with the impact on your communities, that it be equitable. Um, will there be <coughs> deficit reduction that, uh, and I'll come back to this in a few minutes, adheres to a longstanding principle that's been recently reaffirmed by a couple of bipartisan groups that deficit reduction should not increase poverty or income inequality, or in fact, will it make it worse? Um, and fundamentally, we also want to make sure that deficit reduction, and this is again quite relevant to your question, doesn't starve basic services and core programs that Americans rely on, um, both at at the federal level and at the state level. But the risk here, even though President Obama has drawn a line and said there shouldn't be spending cuts without, uh, particularly in entitlements, without significant new revenues, there is a very grave risk here that the Joint Committee will reach an agreement that is very unbalanced. Um, I don't want to say it's likely, but I have to tell you there is a risk that the Joint Committee will agree to a package that relies primarily on spending cuts to reduce the deficit. And if they went down that road, I don't think they'll agree to a deal that's all spending cuts, but if they went down that road, it's a couple of implications. I mean, it, there's no way to get there without deep cuts in entitlements like Medicare and Medicaid. Um, it means you do end up cutting domestic appropriations even further over time because the magnitude of what you have to do without revenue is so big. And fundamentally, I think particularly for our community, we have to think about this as if they agree to a very unbalanced deal, we are moving towards the Ryan budget. And I, I'm sure you all are quite well versed in how extreme the Ryan budget was and what the consequences of those policies would be um, for vulnerable communities, for communities of colors and, and other communities. Um, and, and I think fundamentally, uh, for those of us that do a lot of work on deficit reduction, a very unbalanced deal actually sets us back. If we continue to have conservatives think that they can extract the deep spending cuts without having to give on revenues, then it makes it much harder to get the mix of revenues and cuts that you really need to not only reduce the deficit, to put the kind of then sustain your economy and your budget at much more um, balanced levels. Um, one of the consequences, uh, well, let me before I just answer particularly the philanthropic and nonprofit question, um, let me say that one of the most important things um, that we keep reminding policymakers about that we talk about what's at stake is huge here is that going back to the late 80s, there was a principle established that when you do deficit reduction, you don't want to um, cut the low-income entitlements that would mean that actually low-income people would really suffer. And there was a major commission set up by the president this year, the Bull Simpson Commission, that established as one of its core principles, and they reiterated this in an op-ed on Sunday's Washington Post, that when you do deficit reduction, you should not cut these core programs for the poor. I don't mean appropriated programs, but really the big entitlements, specifically because the principle is you should not increase poverty and you should not increase income inequality in deficit reduction. And yet, I have to tell you, we think there are very significant risks right now facing the Medicaid program and the SNAP program in some of the discussions and some um, with some of the players. For nonprofits and the philanthropic community, 
Um, and I know some, there's been some focus in the philanthropic community on President Obama's proposed change in the tax treatment of charitable contributions and itemized deductions. Um, I don't think from the center's perspective that really is, frankly, the biggest impact or consequence for the philanthropic community or for nonprofits. And frankly, the Obama proposal is, um, is, has no chance of passing the Congress. Um, there's a larger conversation, I think, to be had with um, the charitable sector and the philanthropic sector about tax reform and how do we get revenues down the road. Um, but the much bigger issue, I think, for, for your sectors is that a lot of the cuts that, are, that have been enacted and that are, are at risk here are cuts that affect the areas that you all fund and provide critical services in. In fact, it's worth remembering that in domestic appropriations, one-third of that funding funds money for state and local government. So you're not just talking about the risk of significant cuts in critical services at the federal level, but also at the state level. What that means is if we end up with an unbalanced package, that the demand on nonprofits and the demand on foundations for greater assistance will be much greater. There will be a much deeper fiscal crisis at the state level than we have now. We would see significant cutbacks in critical federal assistance programs, but you'd also see cutbacks in the arts, in the environment, in social services, in housing, in a range of areas, not just low income. Um, and the risk um, of, of that then meaning that there's much greater demand for very limited resources um, is much higher. You know, ironically, I have to say the White House put out a budget, a budget proposal. They're not pushing it. They have said they don't see that we have to have a deal. They don't think there should be a deal at any price. Um, and yet we are very, very worried um, about some of the members of this committee, including, frankly, some of the Democrats, who believe that there is a huge, um, you know, a, a potentially huge, terrible consequences if they don't reach some kind of an agreement. So, Ellen, let me talk to you more about how this uh, discussion is being calibrated uh, in, within the Joint Committee. Uh, you've uh, laid out some kind of, not even uh, the worst case scenario, but just the, maybe the likely scenario of an unbalanced agreement, as you put it. Um, so if you're even worried about our, our, our Democrats to even hold the line, let me ask you, uh, who are the Joint Committee members listening to in, in trying to formulate this, and how do you think uh, they're taking variables into account to make those decisions? Okay. Well, let me just make sure that everybody knows um, who's on the Joint Committee. The, the Joint Committee is made up of 12 members of Congress. Six are from the Senate. Six are from the House. Um, uh, and within each six, it's divided equally between Republicans and Democrats. So six Democrats on the committee, six Republicans. These were appointed by the congressional leaders. Um, and I can tell you that the price of admission to serving on the Joint Committee, uh, from what we understand, was a commitment that in a group of 12, and it only a simple majority is needed to approve a report, there was obviously a grave concern that you could have one Democrat that would vote with Republicans and then they would be able to pass a very unbalanced bill. You could have one Republican vote with Democrats, and that made the Republicans nervous. So I think the one thing we know is there will never be an outcome here of a seven to five vote where one member of one party um, goes to the other side. But there is still an opportunity, and I think some discussions about whether a more meaningful bipartisan agreement can be made up. I mean, on the one hand, I think the Democrats on the group um, are working reasonably well together. They seem quite strong on wanting to ensure a balanced package. They're very clear about the need for revenues. Um, and I think they really don't want to repeat what happened in particular, the process that happened with Vice President Biden's negotiations this summer, where they kind of said, okay, we're going to roll up our sleeves, and we know we can't agree to, you know, we're not going to about talk about taxes right now. And the Democrats said, okay, then we're not going to talk about Social Security and Medicare right now. And then what started to happen was they started to um, talk about areas of spending that they could cut. And Democrats tentatively agreed to some areas in agriculture and some pensions and other things, but said all along it's all contingent upon revenues. And of course, when they got to the revenue conversation, the Republicans walked out and said, we can't talk about that. And then they went around and publicized the list of cuts that they argued Democrats had agreed to. So I think there's a sense now that 
you have to join hands and there cannot be any agreement or any movement towards an agreement unless and until it's clear that Republicans will put significant new revenues on the table, which would then require Democrats to put significant concessions on entitlements in the, on the table. Now, even within that framework, we would argue, as Bull Simpson uh, did and then a bipartisan group called the Gang of Six did in the Senate, that you can still then address revenues and entitlements without cutting the core low-income entitlement programs. Um, the problem is that I think, as I said, there are a number of Democrats on the committee. I mean, all of them would like to succeed. They would like a big a big deal, a balanced deal, a good deal that will sustain kind of with sustainable policies and, and something that they can defend as equitable. But there's a number of them that, for example, have said we're really worried that the markets will crash if there's no deal, or we're really worried about the economy going back into a recession. Don't we really have to tackle, you know, have a deal? Well, we have two major major economic problems at the moment. The much more immediate one is high unemployment, high poverty, and an economy that's teetering on going back into a recession. So there is some interest on the part of the Democrats in figuring out if they can include things in here that promote jobs and would help strengthen the economy. There doesn't seem to be much interest on the part of the Republicans there. But even if that doesn't happen, it's our sense from talking to market people and economists that there would be no major catastrophe for the market or the economy if there's no no deal, um, and that, in fact, what the markets are looking for is a very good and balanced deal. So we're a little worried that there's a risk of self-fulfilling prophecy if members say we can't afford to fail, as some of them have, or if members say there could be you know, a further downgrading if we don't reach an agreement, that they're talking themselves into a place where they can't walk away from a bad deal. There's a lot of pressure being put on the committee. Um, there's a bipartisan group in the Senate called the Warner Chambliss Group that is pressing for major deficit reduction. Um, and while it's loosely based on the Bull Simpson package, I think they'd be um, quite willing to take a package, even if it was very unbalanced. There's a lot of the um, kind of press, editorial pressure in some ways to do a big deal, but obviously there's major pressure on the Republicans not to give one inch, not one inch on revenues. Um, pretty stunning development on Monday when it was leaked to the press that the Senate Republican leadership um, had been in touch with K Street lobbyists last week, assuring them that they wouldn't go for a big, bold three or four billion dollar trillion dollar deal. Um, at best, they'd do the 1.2 trillion, and they would do that um, primarily, if not over, if not exclusively, on the spending side, which was a further sign that the Republicans aren't budging. So um, it's not really clear who they're listening to. They're, they're different forces pressuring them in different ways. Again, we're hopeful that they look at the framework and the and the position that the president has taken, which is if they can get a bipartisan deal that's a good balanced deal, they should, but it's not default. We're not in the same place. There's no reason to take a very unbalanced or bad deal. And I think the more the group spends time as they are now in a lot of closed door sessions, the more you worry about them talking themselves into, you know, we have to reach some kind of an agreement. See. Uh for those of you listening in, another reminder, if you'd like to get some questions in, uh, please email Heidi at hgatty, that's H-G-A-T-T-Y, at tides.org. Though we're not guaranteed that we'll ask your question, we'll do our best to get some in. Uh, Ellen, I'd like to continue that conversation, to continue that uh, discussion of that issue about uh, how to influence uh, this committee. Uh, you laid out some very sobering numbers in terms of what we're facing here in terms of the work uh, that we do for the audience members listening to this call. You cited about uh, the census figures about the 20 million Americans that are living below half the poverty line and the uh, brunt of the federal appropriations uh, dollars at stake, a third of that uh, being designated to state and local governments where vital services and basic services may not be provided as they have been in the past, so it may be up to uh, the folks listening to this call and their organizations to step up and provide that gap. Right. Uh, all that at stake, what are some of the things that the leaders of, of nonprofit and philanthropic leaders can do uh, to pressure members of the Joint Committee uh, about these consequences? Well, let me, let me um, take that question and maybe even expand it a little bit, but let me just say I think one of the things that is um, – 
a major factor here is the clock. I mean, the Senate leaves the last week of October for a one-week recess. You get back in November. If you really are moving on a deal and you have to write up detailed policy decisions, you have to move to that pretty quickly. So I do think that the next two weeks, maybe three, but particularly the next two weeks are really critical. Um, that's the point. You know, this is the, the, the window in which Republicans um, will need to give some indication of whether they're serious about revenues or not. Democrats will probably be brought to the point where they have to make a decision that if Republicans refuse to budge on revenues, will they continue to negotiate? Will they be willing to reach any kind of an agreement? So I think the window um, of opportunity is a window that is, is, now, uh, is now really upon us. Um, I think from our perspective, it is really critical for all of us to be communicating um, two fundamental principles to the Democrats on the committee, but I also want to talk about key people off the committee that really could help influence the outcome of these deliberations. The first is that we don't want to end up in a world where the choice is a bad deficit reduction deal, very unbalanced, big spending cuts, very inequitable, little, little revenues, or facing the sequester in 2013. But that is quite likely what this will come down to. And if it comes down to that, it is very much our view here, and Bob and I have been meeting with a lot of these policymakers to say our strong recommendation is that a bad de that no deal is better than a bad deal. So point number one is we really need to hold policymakers accountable that we've given already away $900 billion of spending cuts. We have a, you know, a tr tremendous serious problem now with poverty and unemployment and that there is no reason to agree to a highly unbalanced deal that requires the overwhelming bulk of deficit reduction to come from cutting spending. They have to be willing to walk away from a bad deal. Um, we don't really have to worry about I mean, I know people don't want to see the sequester happen, neither do we, but we have a year for that sequester to hit. And more importantly, between now and January 2013, if you look at the end of 2012, you have the Bush tax cuts expiring, you have the need to raise the debt ceiling again, and you'd have the potential for a sequester. So the dynamics and the leverage may shift if this comes together in a broader fight about what we're going to do about extending the Bush tax cuts, obviously, particularly for the most wealthy Americans. Um, so we, it, it's not as though if the committee fails, we automatically will have the sequester that will take effect next year, particularly because half of the across-the-board cuts, and I apologize, I should have mentioned this earlier, half of the across-the-board cuts come right out of the Pentagon, and the other half come out of domestic. The White House's argument was that with that kind of, and pardon a bad analogy here, I keep searching for another one, but with a gun to the head, so to speak, with a threat of deep across-the-board cuts in defense, that it would bring Republicans to the table and they would finally concede on revenues. I'm not sure I think it's going to play out the way the White House intended, but that sequester, as long as it threatens defense, um, certainly could change between now and January. So that's principle number one is insisting on a balanced deal and insisting that they walk away from an unbalanced deal. Principle number two is really is saying to them that they must adhere to this principle that's been reaffirmed by Bull Simpson, the bipartisan gang of six, and longstanding history, that revenues or no revenues, low-income entitlement programs cannot be cut, that you cannot have deficit reduction that increases poverty and income inequality. Now, I think there are three groups that may, you may want to think about in terms of your action. The first is, and obviously most of the Republicans in, in their group of six are quite conservative. I know there's been some groups in Ohio and Michigan that have been trying to bring some pressure on Republic, Republican uh, members Camp and Upton and Senator Portman from Ohio. So there's some work there that's obviously a, a tough nut to crack. So let me set them aside for one second. From the perspective of the Democrats on the committee, there are there's the work that we can do with the six Democrats on the committee now, and that's work we've been doing and many, you know, some of you may be doing as well with those specific members, particularly with a combination of what we like to call grassroots and grass tops work um, from back home. But the House and Senate Democratic leadership is quite important. Uh, Senator Reid is working very closely with Senator Murray. Um, Senator Murray, Patty Murray from Washington, is the chair for the Democrats on the Joint Committee. And 
and Reid and Murray in many ways are calling the shots. So, uh, but Senator Schumer, Senator Durbin, Senator Reid are very important in terms of the guidance they're giving the Democrats on the Joint Committee. Um, obviously, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer are very, very important on the House side. But there's another group of Democrats whose voice needs to um, be elevated and whom we really have to engage in this process. And those are Democrats, in, particularly in the Senate, who are not on the Joint Committee. Um, there are progressive Democrats in the Senate who could be uh, raising issues in Senate caucus meetings. They could be talking to Senator Reid and Senator Murray and, you know, maybe expressing support for a comprehensive balanced deal, but really urging them to be careful to handle this tactically and strategically so that if there is nothing on the table other than a bad deal, the Democrats can walk away from that. So. I think there are a number of progressive Democrats that we could be talking to in the Senate and asking them for their help. And there are a number of moderate Democrats. I mean, there are, there are moderate Democrats that are in the warner Chambliss group and others who desperately want a meaningful, big, bipartisan deficit reduction deal. Um, we all would like to see that. But I think some of them probably would agree that while they want a deal, it's not a deal at any price, and we should not take a deal if it's entirely or almost entirely all spending cuts. Um, and so it is at least worth tempering, I think, um, expectations that are being created, particularly by more conservative Democrats that are not helpful, that we absolutely have to have a deal. So for those of you that have, you know, Democrats on the committee, for those of you that have Democrats in the leadership, and those of you that have Democrats, um, particularly in the Senate, who could be engaged along some of these core principles, I think that might be your focus of attention, but as I said, within a pretty narrow time frame here. Ellen, thank you very much for that. In the last two minutes that we have with you, because I know you've got to go off and uh, run back to Capitol Hill. Uh, Actually, I'm able, to stay, I'm able to stay on longer. Okay, great. Yeah, um, my meeting was canceled, case. so I'm able, to stay on for, I'm able to stay on for another 15 minutes. Okay. So why don't we do this then? Can you give us um, a more in-depth analysis of what your prognosis of the situation is going to be, uh, in, your, in your opinion? Um, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, and what is the best case scenario and what is the worst case scenario? Okay, well, good way to end that question. The best case scenario, um, it, well, let me say two best cases scenario. I mean, in a world, in an ideal world, we would be looking at the totality of deficit reduction from the law passed this summer. All, the, the, the $900 billion that we did and the, the $1.2 that we have to do, and we would say, the deficit reduction should be 50-50, right? You want half of deficit reduction from spending cuts and half from revenues. And that would mean that the Joint Committee would mostly have to come up with revenues. That is absolutely not going to happen. But there's another scenario that, while it is a tall order, um, is not as, as kind of ludicrous strategically as that one is. And that is that the framework for deficit reduction that's really been established by both Simpson and Gang of Six, who rejected the 50-50, unfortunately, is a $2 of spending cuts for every dollar of revenue. That is not the best plan, but that's the best that's on the table, is a framework that says we're going to reduce the deficit in a two-to-one framework, $2 of spending cuts for a dollar of revenues. If the Joint Committee were to try to reach something close to two-to-one, it would say, it would start with a $900 billion it, w it had already cut and say, okay, we have another 1.2 we have to go. And in order to end up close to two to one, we have to, in the Joint Committee, ensure that for every spending dollar we cut, we provide a new dollar of revenues. So you'd want 50-50 within the Joint Committee, and then adding the $900 billion of cuts to that, you end up between, frankly, two to one and a three to one ratio. That is the best case scenario that would mean new revenues. You would make modifications perhaps um, in Medicare, maybe some in Medicaid, but you also would exempt all of the other low income entitlements from any cuts. That is a very tall order and not where I would put my next paycheck, um, bet my next paycheck. So I don't think the chance of a meaningful, equitable, balanced deals with revenues and entitlements is huge. But things could change. I mean, even though you know, four weeks isn't a lot of time in Washington. Um, in some ways, it's a lifetime around here because people can see as far as tomorrow. And particularly with what's happening in Greece and Europe, um, if there's a real fiscal implosion, that could really change the dynamics and put enormous pressure on this group to reach a deal and reach a deal fast. The worst case scenario, 
would be if Democrats agree to a deal that requires or that, that – uh, a deal that reaches the $1.2 trillion with most of that $1.2 trillion coming from spending cuts. And that would mean, as I said, there's no way to get there without deep cuts in Medicare and Medicaid. It probably means they abandon the principle, of which, of course, they haven't even formally agreed to, but it means they reject the principle of protecting the poor, and there would be cuts in Medicaid and SNAP and in other things. And it probably also means, again, further cuts in domestic appropriations, which certainly comes home to haunt all of you, I think. So, um, and, and I think if you do a deal that's only $1.2 trillion and it's overwhelmingly spending, then while it will certainly reduce the debt, it is not enough to stabilize the debt as a percent of our economy. And so what that means is that within a couple of years, we'll be back at the table. The knives will be out. We'll have to do more on deficit reduction. And you will have already cut the heck out of critical spending. And at that point, what's left to cut? What's left to cut, especially um, if Republicans have even more control than they do now of government and are even more resistant to revenues? So those are the best case and the worst case. What do I think will happen? I think there's probably a little, probably more than a 50-50 uh, ch percent chance that the committee fails to reach an agreement. Um, whether they then leave that at there and, and deal with the sequester and fight it out next year remains to be seen, whether there's some pressure to do something. But I, I think there's a, a, a decent chance that the committee will not be able to reach any agreement. But I don't think that we can operate on that assumption. And we, Bob and I have been very worried about some folks that have prematurely, in our view, concluded that the Joint Committee can never reach a deal and they're kind of on to the next issue rather than keeping the pressure up here for a balanced deal, but even more pressure to reject an unbalanced deal. So hopefully that answers that question. But as I said, I'm, I'm uh, happy to stay on for another 10 minutes and answer other questions. Sure. Ellen, uh, let me just ask you a follow-up question to that. Before I get to that, I just want to uh, remind the audience, if you have uh, further questions, please email Heidi at hgaddy at tides.org. Uh, as a follow-up, uh, if there is no deal that is struck, so um, aside from the worst-case or best-case scenario, if there is no deal, uh, you said earlier on that one of the things that we can start emphasizing is that, uh, that uh, not to... Uh, accept a, a bad deal over a no deal. So say that uh, the Democrats and the progressives uh, that are there to uh, uh, help hold the line in terms of our communities, they say, you know what, we're not going to take a bad deal. We're just going to walk away from the table. If there is no deal, what is the opportunity then and what are the next steps that could happen? Um, if there is no deal, then I think we have to see whether um – I assume that means, although we have to double check on this, that um, that means that the fiscal battle is uh, kicked into 2012. I'm not 100 percent sure it will play out that way. There are some members, including on the Democratic side, who feel that if the Joint Committee can't reach an agreement, that they do not want there to be any hint of a sequester. And ironically, some Democrats are very nervous about the defense sequester. They don't want to be blamed, particularly in election year, for what would be described as cuts that eviscerate our national defense and, you know, all that stuff. So if there's no agreement in the Joint Committee, we must remain vigilant for the rest of the year to see if there's some effort to put together something else um, or some um, other proposal that comes to the table. So we, we have to kind of stay on our guard on that. What it really means, though, is that we have to spend next year more than anything really gearing up for the fight on the tax cuts. Um, it, it is not enough, I think, for all of us to think that the tax cut battle um, is simply about the Bush tax cuts. In fact, if you look at the Bull Simpson uh, agreement and the Gang of Six agreement and other deficit reduction proposals, what is really not well understood about Bull Simpson and Gang of Six, this was a bipartisan group of six senators in the Senate, is that they raised roughly a trillion dollars of new revenues on top of the Bush tax cuts expiring. So we really have to understand the magnitude of the revenues we need to move forward. That said, we will never get to those higher revenues if we can't beat back the extension of the Bush tax cuts for the upper income. Frankly, we have come to a position um, here, and I don't, I'm not meaning to tell you I think this is um, – 
uh, legislatively feasible. But if you look at the deficit and you look at what it's going to take to really stabilize our debt as a percent of our economy, one can make a very strong argument that if all of the Bush tax cuts expired, you would have done um, – a very, very, very substantial amount of what you need to do to tackle that deficit and debt. So um, that's, of course, not going to happen. But I think what we have to do is, if there's no agreement this fall, is can, is work next year to put substantial pressure on policymakers. And I think you have to worry as much about, you know, a, a, about a lot of Democrats in this mix to ensure that we are building the case that we have a long-term fiscal problem, that tough choices are needed on the spending on the tax side, but that there is no way this Congress can extend the tax cuts for the wealthy. And there are some very, very, in our view, worrisome developments in the Senate with some Democrats that no longer define the upper income tax cuts as simply for Americans with incomes over 250000 We have a growing trend among some senators that want to define upper income as people over a million. Well, there is actually a huge amount of revenue for families with incomes between 250000 and a million dollars. It's actually several, it's billions of dollars. So the, the definition of middle class is creeping up for Democrats, particularly in election year. I think we have to really think about how to put pressure on them next year to make sure that they're not extending the Bush tax cuts for the upper income, which at the moment, you know, or for those, as the Obama administration has defined, is with incomes over 250000 I think the other thing, Sam, that is really critical is that the irony is is that there's so much an, an antagonism in the country for what's happened now for, and particularly for the, the way that the role of the government played out with the economic recovery. People think the stimulus didn't work. They think TARP only helped Wall Street. They think the auto bailout was a disaster. In fact, what the government did did under Bush and Obama did work. It, it, it didn't work well enough. We didn't go far enough, but it in fact worked. But what that means is there's a much less confidence in government, and therefore there's much more of a willingness, I think, on the part of the public to say, you know, we just need to cut more spending. And I think much of what we have to do, particularly at the state and the federal level, is show that additional deep spending cuts now, what that means for critical services at the state level, what it means for nonprofits and foundations, what it means for a range of critical services. I think we have to help people understand um, we've cut a, nearly a trillion. We're going to have to cut more, but we really have to make sure people understand, for example, what it would mean to adopt the Ryan budget. What would it mean for education? What would it mean for health care? What it would mean for people's access to, you know, affordable housing, um, those kinds of things. So I think it's that tension between really deeply engaging in the revenue battle next year with somehow strengthening support for critical programs and building opposition to deep cuts in those critical programs. Ellen, um, I'd like to ask you one more question before we would conclude, and that is, um, what about the things that are going on recently? So uh, Warren Buffett came out uh, on the other side of the fence saying uh, it's unfair that what I make, uh, I pay less in taxes than my assistant does, uh, at 18% versus 35%, uh, respectively. Um, what effect has that had on the debate, as well as what Elizabeth Warren came out and said in launching her Santa campaign, and as well as the growing Occupy Wall Street movement? Is this having any impact at all? I think there's some for sure. I mean, you see a lot of Democrats now, when they talk about taxes, the only way they're comfortable about talking about taxes is something like the millionaire's tax or, you know, they talk about things like, you know, oil, oil and gas or, or, you know, corporate jets, kind of tax breaks for wealthy corporations and tax breaks for very wealthy Americans. And those resonate incredibly well. There's very strong support in the public um, to reduce tax breaks for very rich Americans and for corporations. The, and that makes it easier, I think, for Democrats to talk about. The, the problem, Sam, that that creates is the perception that that's going to generate enough revenue, that just doing those things will somehow spare critical programs from cuts. And while it certainly would raise um, significant amounts of revenue if we raise uh, taxes on the most wealthy in the country and we close some of the loopholes that allow corporations not to pay tax or some of the egregious tax breaks, it still doesn't get you where you need to be. Um, and so to me, it, it's helpful in the sense that it, it frames the larger debate about income inequality. It 
it underscores how much the wealthy have benefited from our tax code in the last two decades and how important it is to try to raise revenues from them. But my only caveat is it also plays into Democrats that want to only raise taxes at the very top, um, and then we're left with probably not enough revenues in a deficit reduction agreement to avoid um, very painful spending cuts. So on balance, absolutely helpful. I think it puts back on the table some important language and framing for the larger debate, but I think we have to be a little careful not to look like the Buffett rule, as it's now called, as the be-all and end-all in um, raising revenues in terms of a larger balanced deficit reduction agreement. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, Ellen. Uh, well, I think in the overall context of things, none of this makes sense. Yes, but that's true. <laughs> none of it does make sense, right? But thank you for the time and, and clarifying some of these uh, issues for us. We really want to thank you for this time. Oh, I'm more, more, more than happy to do it, and I am more than happy if anybody wants to shoot me an email or if you do, if there are people that didn't have time to ask questions or um, think of other questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer those questions by email, and you guys should just feel free to send them along, and I'll make sure I respond in a timely fashion. I hope folks will look at the center's website. I just wanted to end on that note, um, www.cb pp.org. Uh, we have uh, consistent materials coming out on the poverty issues, on the income inequality issues, and especially the deficit issues, um, and particularly are doing a lot more blogging in this area uh, as well. So I er encourage you to look at our website and look at the blog on our website, and hopefully that will support you all in the very important work that you're doing. Again, that website is cb, as in boy, pp. Dot org, and that's the Center on, on Budget and Policy Priorities. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Ellen Niesenbaum over the phone. Thank you so much again, again, Ellen. And if you'd like to learn more about Greenlining, please visit us at greenlining.org.